And we have Va Valley CDCs in attendance. They're the only um, attendees right now. Okay. Um, okay, so we should get started. Um, I don't have any announcements. You know, Nate, when I don't have the language for this, but every other meeting starts with an explanation how either the governor or the attorney general or both allow us to meet uh, via Zoom during this emergency. And we've never said that. I don't know if that's an issue. Presumably it isn't since uh, we yeah, haven't been doing it. Some, I know the planning board has a script and um, yeah, I think it's okay. I mean, it's kind of the, uh, can everyone see the agenda? I'm having some many issues with my screen. Yeah, I think we're fine. I mean, if it were, um, you know, we do roll call votes and then we let people know that it's on Zoom. So I feel like we haven't had any issues. Okay, fine. Okay, I don't have any announcements. Does anybody else have any announcements? No. Okay, well then we got through announcements pretty quickly. Um, for the next step, review minutes from October, which I think I sent out at least a week or so ago. Um, I don't have them in front of me. Does anybody have any comments? These minutes exclude the executive session. I wasn't quite sure whether we can share them. Uh, I know we can't share them in the public part of the meeting, but I'm still not even sure whether we can share them in an executive session either. No, I think in executive session we can, then they remain part of the executive session. Uh, okay. So we won't share, you know, we don't have those minutes to review now. Only the public meeting portion of the last time. Okay, so are there any comments on the minutes from our October meeting? That's good. We don't have any, John. Okay. <laughs> Has Kevin Noonan joined us? Uh, there's no. Not yet. Not yet. Want me to email him or he knows about it, right? Well, yes, but it might be a reminder would be helpful. All right. Um, so uh, we'll see if Kevin comes mm -hmm. to us. If not, well, in the meantime, anyway, we'll skip down to the progress report on emerg the emergency rental assistance program. Mm -hmm. um, Jana couldn't be with us tonight because she has a conflict uh, with the East Town East Housing uh, Fair Housing Group. It's not Fair Housing. It's uh, what's the name of that group? Community Action. No, no, it's a housing group. It's the same as Northampton's group. Oh yeah, the uh, uh, East Hampton Housing Partnership. Yeah, thank you. That's it, Rita. <laughs> Okay, so Jana has a conflict. There's a couple of things I wanted to talk about, but the first one really is, um, what do people think, or do you have any questions about uh, the report that Jana sent us? Uh, I'm not gonna read it, it's about a page long, and it provides a summary of round one, an indication of where we are so far on round two, and uh, a brief, outline of the changes that we made that make round two different than round one. So does anybody have any questions about this? The only possible question was Jana's uh, feedback that people thought it was unfair that uh, students, I guess, sharing a household um, were being treated as a household and not individually. And I I know that's the way it's done in every other housing program. So I, I don't have any feeling that we need to change anything, but I just wondered if anybody else did. Uh, yeah, thanks, Tom. That was a, right, that's one point of discussion is that, you know, we don't allow roommates if they're covered under one lease. And so there's been a few um, applications where, you know, one roommate is claiming to have a hardship, the others are not. And then 
you know, the other roommates aren't willing to share uh, financial information and, and then it's ineligible anyways, if there's, you know, they're probably over income, but, you know, I agree, Tom, we've kept, you know, the definition of household to be, you know, if, for instance, if someone had a different lease for each bedroom in a unit, then individually they, you know, they could apply, but this isn't the case if there's, you know, one lease with four different tenants. Um, I mean, I suppose it's possible that there's some sort of sublease, even if it's not formal. Um, and if there was some documentation that in fact, um, the lease was not um, collectively shared, but mm -hmm. oftentimes those leases name everyone in the house on the, on the lease. And so if one person fails to pay the rent, the rest are obligated to pay. Um, so it's a little bit hard to tease that apart. But, yeah. yeah, I was talking, somebody else wanted to speak? I was just gonna guess that a lot of times the agreement between the roommates is more informal than being part of the lease. And they have some who is gonna pay how, what part of it, but it's probably not part of the lease written down somewhere. So, yeah. There's a lot of different forms, but you know, a lot of the landlords have gotten pretty sophisticated these days and uh, they require everybody who lives there to be obligated to pay the rent regardless of you know how they choose to divide it up right yeah i'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute or two but uh i was talking to ellen schachter uh earlier this week i guess or late i think it was earlier this week ellen schachter is the director of housing stability for the city of somerville and I'd heard Ellen speak about the things that the city has done in order to try to ameliorate the eviction crisis in Somerville. And one of the things she mentioned offhand, which I need to get back to her about, is that they found a way in Somerville to allow households to be eligible if there is no lease or if no one who's living in the household is on the lease. Apparently it's not unheard of for the name on the lease to be someone who has since left the unit to move someplace else. And the people who remain on the lease or who remain in the unit are not on the lease. And yet they may need assistance. So that's one of a number of issues that I'd like to uh, get an opportunity to talk more to Ellen about. Uh, Nate and I also spent some time talking to Jana and also Donna Bouton, who works with her on the Amherst Emergency Rental Assistance Project. And this was partly stimulated by a call that the town manager's office received saying that they were slow to respond or to get in touch with people after the preliminary application had been sent in. Um, so far, there's only been one complaint like that. And it sounded as if they were able to get to the person uh, in a little over a week. Um, nonetheless, that seemed a little long, but uh, in general, when Nate and I were talking about this, it felt like we had expected to see more people approved for payment at this point in time in round two than, than we were seeing. Um, I mean, the good news is that over 80 people or households had applied. Um, so we're approaching the 100 who applied in round one. There may be a little bit of overlap there, but the process of working with people to get through an application, a completed application um, with whatever documentation is necessary and then have them approved seems to be taking a long time. And, you know, as Nate and I talked to Jana and Donna, it appeared that every case, or maybe not every case, but it's not uncommon for cases to prevent, present special circumstances that require additional thought or consideration um, that make it difficult to uh, process the case 
and again, I, I mean, one example we talked about was uh, two men, not students, who are on the same lease sharing a place. And uh, one of them does have a financial problem and the other does not. And so under our rules, they are now excluded. Uh, and there were other examples like that. They didn't necessarily result in the household um, being excluded, but uh, it just seemed like um, there were at least half a dozen different cases that Donna or Jana presented to us that indicated that a lot of work was going into each of these cases. Do you wanna add anything to what I'm saying, Nate? No, I mean, I think, you know, the, um, you know, Jana did say that, you know, the, with round two, there's a pre-application, which does try to, you know, screen applicants in terms of basic eligibility, and then a caseworker um, from community action will respond to them to set, you know, set up a phone interview. And sometimes that might be a week to get back to someone to schedule, and then it's a few days out. And then she's finding that, you know, it's taking, you know, more than one call and the first call will be over an hour. And then it often takes two or three calls to get all the paperwork and everything together. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I, I just, you know, I'm also working with the microenterprise assistance grants and some businesses have been complaining about that we have to do income documentation for that. And I'm like, well, it's block grant money. So we do, and then they're like, well, you know, and I'm like, you know, and I know the tenants maybe are feeling the same way, but it's like we have, there's, you know, we ask for as little as we can with the um, housing program. You know, we only ask for a bank statement and, um, you know, a copy of the lease and not a lot of uh, other information. So I don't know. Yeah, John, it, it is interesting. Community action seem like every case has something unique, whether it's a roommate or, you know, wor um, working age children who are now at home and are they part of the income and, you know, um, you know, I think eventually, though, it does take four to six weeks to to get someone approved and have a payment being processed, which isn't, you know, I think that's pretty, uh, pretty standard for a lot of these programs. So I think it is a lot of upfront work. But in the end, it does, they do get approved. Um, you know, Jana did say that only one or two households in round two right now are behind on their rent. So for whatever reason, mm -hmm. the tenants that are applying aren't, you know, they're, they've been able to make payments. So I don't know if, you know, in the next month, we're going to see many more households because of the eviction moratoriums ended. And, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's just odd that we haven't had, a, I was, I was thinking we'd see more applicants and more be being approved. Right. I mean, I, I would think that people could just do a pre-app, have one phone call, say, here's my COVID loss. I've lost my job. Here's my household information. And then it's like a week later, they're getting processed, but it doesn't seem to work that way. Um, Carol. I was wondering what one of the things in the report said that one of the other things that was hard was demonstrating the COVID re relatedness of any income laws. And I just wondered, what, how does somebody demonstrate that? I lost my job. How do I? I mean, I don't know. I don't even know what the hoop is that you have to jump through, but maybe it's not, maybe it's too hard, or maybe that's something that we could look at again. I don't know. My recollection is that occurred with households in which the adults were being paid under the table. You know, they were working in a restaurant and they were receiving income and then they lost their jobs. But in fact, they don't have any pay stubs because they're uh, illegal immigrants. And so it's hard to demonstrate that. You know, I, <laughs> it's like Nate and I were both saying every case seem to have some kind of an issue with it. Um, and we, and with, the, with the loss of income too, we've, we've you know, we've also, um, you know, told Community Action that if there's a story and it's plausible, then they can self-declare. There's a form, you know, where they can essentially assign something saying that it, you know, that's, that, that's it. Um, you know, because if they don't have a bank statement or some, you know, some, some households don't have bank accounts. And so then they, it really is really difficult to show a loss, but if they have a story and it seems consistent, you know, community action can use their discretion to allow them. But um, yeah, I mean, I don't, 
you know, we weren't asking for more than just a proof of loss of income or something or some hardship. And I guess some households are having difficulty even providing that, you know, what some type of documentation on that. It is surprising. Yeah. Especially given the, the numbers that I read somewhere of how many expected evictions there are in the next short amount of time. How yes. can, this seems, seems these things just don't seem consistent with each other somehow. Well, this got me to thinking about how we are using our resources. And I'm not going to propose a change to our existing program tonight. My sense is that we should at least follow it into December and then start to think about whether there's something else we should do. But I will say that the, uh, again, coming back to the city of Somerville, one of the things they've done is to focus on getting people into the raft program rather than into uh, their own rental assistance program. They have a separate rental assistance program which uses uh, money from the city of Somerville exclusively. There's no CPA or CARES money, so they're pretty flexible in how they can use it. We wouldn't have that option. But just to going back, the reason they prioritize RAFT, I believe, is that, frankly, there's more money in it for the tenants. Um, RAFT now has a maximum payment that goes up to $10,000. I believe we're capped at a little over 3,000. Is that right, Nate or Rita? Yeah, like 3,300. 3,300. And so all I started to think about is if community action is going to do all this work, maybe it would be better if they were helping people get into the RAFT program than our rental assistance program. Uh, and again, I want to let the program run a little bit more, but uh, and I also want to understand better how Somerville manages all of this. I hope to set up a conference call with Jenna and Donna and Nate and I, possibly Rita, to talk about how Somerville is doing things. There are a variety of things that they're doing to try to ameliorate the problem of evictions. And there are other things, not necessarily that things that the Housing Trust could do, but things that the town could do, which I also want to mention. I mean, I actually did send out an email to a lot of people, including I believe all of you, about things that the town could do based primarily on what Somerville is currently doing and actually Boston and Cambridge are both doing similar things as well. So again, I don't regret that we started this emergency rental assistance program. At the time we started it, which when we started thinking about it, I believe last March, it made perfect sense. But as things are starting to change, I'm not so sure that this is the best way for us to use the resources we have available. John, I would just say that I think, you know, generally um, these types of programs are incredibly complicated and require a whole lot of layers of, of review and um, revision over time. And it's often uh, years after you roll out a program before you get it right. And so if in any way you can piggyback onto an existing program with existing staff, with existing rules, with a track record and, and have figured it out that, you know, that's, that's usually the best course because reinventing the wheel, um, although that's an oversimplification, um, can be uh, problematic. Yeah, I, I don't want to say focusing on raft is necessarily a perfect solution. No. Um, there are a huge number of raft applications that are backlogged statewide. Mm -hmm. At least that's my understanding. And the raft agencies in this area, primarily Wayfinders, but also the Franklin County group, don't have enough staff to process all the applications that they're receiving efficiently or effectively. 
Uh, now, what I did learn is that Somerville has a kind of separate relationship with the uh, Metropolitan Boston Agency that administers RAFT. That agency set up a sort of a separate application line for Somerville and other towns in Metropolitan Boston. So their clients don't have to go through the regular route. They can do their applications with the town supporting them. And I made Jana aware of this and she has an appointment scheduled with Wayfinders to see whether there's something that uh, they could do to make it easier for community action to support people who are applying for raft. Uh, as Tom said, nothing is easy when it comes to this. Yeah. Uh, and it, I, it's kind of- I it's just want to point out that as of Monday, uh, Wayfinders will have a new administrator running the RAF program. <laughs> and I happen to know her personally. She's uh, amazingly uh, effective and hardworking. And, uh, and if anybody can turn that around, it will be, it will be she. Yeah, uh, that, that's great news. But again, if, um, if she doesn't have the staff. Well, I, I heard they took the whole wing of that new building down in Springfield that was supposed to go to their development team. And they told the development team they couldn't come because they needed 20 offices for the emergency assistance team. So I don't know how many people you need to run that program, but it sounds like they've got a pretty hefty group there. Well, that's good. That's good. And maybe Jana can work out a relationship and others in Hampshire and then counties can work out a, yeah. a relationship with RAFT where it would help the Wayfinder staff um, and enable more people to get into that program more quickly. Uh, I mean, again, we'll know more about how our program is going and what, if anything, Jan is able to work out with RAFT by the time we meet in December. Um, but I did want to let people know that uh, uh, at that point, we, we may need to be considering changes to the program that we have or trying to figure out what it is that we can do to best help households who are having difficulty meeting the rent payments. Um, I mean, I will say too that, you know, the housing court is going to be meeting every day. And they're trying to hear three cases an hour and I know they're behind, but you know, most of the cases they're hoping to refer to local programs like the one we've set up or other resources. So it may be that you know, in December and January, the program actually gets busier because we're getting, you know, um, you know, the court is referring tenants and landlords to mediation or to find other solutions than eviction. So, you know, I don't know if we consider it emergency assistance then or if we right, we change it, but we may end up getting more, you know, tenants who are actually in the eviction process who are returning to the program as opposed to, you know, you know, applying beforehand. Not that it makes a difference, but it, you know, we may want to have different criteria if someone is in the eviction process. So how does, you know, how does that happen? But yeah, I agree. I think we're checking in monthly with community action and we can let the trust know if there's changes or ideas we could present. Yeah, I also mentioned that there are a few other things that maybe we should be recommending to town council. Um, legal services attorneys around the state, at least this is my impression, are recommending that uh, tenants notify landlords that they wanna take advantage of what is called the CDC moratorium. I don't know if people have heard about that the federal centers for disease control basically set up a program in which if people inform their landlords that they can't pay their rent and are at risk of being homeless, uh, then they can't be evicted. They literally cannot be thrown out of their apartment. That's the good news. The bad news is that it sunsets as of right now on December 31st, 2020. Nonetheless, again, legal services attorneys have been recommending that people do this as a way of 
trying to hold off to get a little bit more time for people to get into raft or to get into other programs uh, if they're in trouble with their rent. Um, also, as Nate said, the housing courts have a big backlog of cases. There was something like 900 uh, cases waiting in the wings, so to speak, for the state eviction moratorium to end. And it's gonna take a while for those 900 cases to be processed in Western Massachusetts. And that doesn't include the new cases that will undoubtedly start to flow as well. So the housing courts can't move too quickly because they, they don't have the capacity either. Uh, so anything that, again, we can do um, ought to be helpful. Uh, the city of Somerville has done a few other things that I will mention. Uh, one of the things they did is to ask Somerville landlords to sign the pledge. Uh, Francis, you may know more about the pledge than I do because I know mass housing finance um, was working with landlords around the state to try to get them to sign the pledge. Basically, it's a pledge to work with tenants and not try to think of evicting them as the first line of what to do. Uh, the pledge has a few elements, which I'm not recalling off the top of my head. Can you recall what they are, Francis? Yes, and I'm going to share it. Can I, is there a chat I can share with? Because we have it online too, but basically it's the same as the uh, Boston, um, the city of Boston put out their own pledge. So it's basically a copy of that one, but statewide, but also includes an addition for mediation. Um, let me pull it up so I know exactly. Okay, well, Francis is doing that, honestly, the details are not what's important. What's important is that the town asks landlords, perhaps particularly the major landlords, to sign the pledge. Uh, and again, who knows whether they'll sign it. Uh, the city of Boston, the city of Cambridge, and I believe Mass Housing Finance has had a lot of success in getting landlords uh, in Massachusetts to sign the pledge. So maybe we could have uh, some success here and that would also help to stave off some evictions. Again, that's not something the housing trust could do. It would really be something that town council would need to do. And yeah, I think what happened was most of the uh, uh, groups that were um, associated with mass housing. So for instance, in Amherst Beacon signed on to that. Right. And, and the larger uh, property owners, uh, property managers, Trinity, Peabody, others, uh, of course we signed on, all the other nonprofits around the state signed on. It was spearheaded by the Massachusetts Association of CDCs together with mass housing and DHCD. And uh, there was a press release just uh, today that went out. I guess you have that, Francis. I I don't have the press release, but yes. Yeah, so at Mass Housing, the the onus was to start with our largest um, uh, partners because they of course have the most units. But since then, uh, primarily Chapa, so the Citizen Housing mm -hmm. Planning and Advocacy Group, uh, have been in charge of sort of spreading it out. Uh, but basically, it promises, it asks um, the landlords and managers to abide by and support the current CDC eviction moratorium, engage with residents and create payment plans, uh, support and accept rental assistant payments, uh, promote rent adjustments for qualified households that either have Section 8 or uh, the mobile vouchers, and encourage mediation. Um, so, you know, I've been just encouraging people to share it with um, other folks. So it, it can be from city council, but I think it can also be if, if anybody knows landlords that have a share of units, that we can also share it, I think. I just uh, forwarded it to Nate if you want to send it out to everybody, Nate. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah thanks, Tom. Just going to say it would be helpful if I could get a copy of that, Francis. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I'll, Nate, I'll share. Um, Tom, did you share the Google Doc or the Word Doc? This is oh. an email I got from uh, Mass Housing's uh, press spot guy, Tom. Oh, Tom yes. Farmer. Tom Farmer. Okay, I'll, I'll share what I have too, just in case. Nate. Oh, great. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I mean, some, you know, I've spoken with some landlords, both for renters and business owners, and some seem pretty willing to, you know, to work with their tenants. And some of the larger ones in town, I think, are are frustrated because, you know, not only is it, um, you know, tenants and you know, there's also some students. So I know some of them are feeling pressure because they've lost rent from, you know, different types of renters. And so, um, you know, it is interesting in Amherst with so many student rentals, you know, would we modify this, <laughs> you know, like what, you know, what's the, you know, would a landlord, some of the larger ones in Amherst be, you know, wary of signing it because they may have student renters who have, you know, kind of abandoned their leases, whereas, you know, smaller renters may be fine because they actually want to help their tenants. I just, you know, is there a way to nuance it to fit, uh, to tailor it to Amherst if we need to? Um, but, you know, I think it's a good idea. We, with the rental program, we have asked landlords to sign on actually saying that they would, you know, originally it was kind of almost similar to this, but now it's just to work with the agreement um, and Jana said that all but one landlord has been really willing to work with the rental assistance program. I guess one was hesitant for whatever reason to um, sign an agreement with the town, so. Okay, moving on, I'll mention two other things quickly that Somerville has done. Um, they created a program called the Housing Stability Notification Act. And essentially, what it means is that when landlords send a notice to quit to a household, they also have to send them information about resources that can be used to try to prevent eviction uh, for pot potential sources of funding that would enable them to pay their rent or pay the arrears. Um, and so landlords are actually required to do this in Somerville. Uh, when they send out a notice to quit, notice to quit to households. Um, so that's something in principle the town could do. I do want to say that uh, when we start getting into things the town can do, we do have to recognize there are limitations on the number and availability of staff in town hall to implement something like this. Uh, Somerville has an entire office of housing stability uh, that's separate from other housing offices that they have. Uh, so they're a slightly larger uh, locality than Amherst is, and it's easier for them to do things like this. Nonetheless, they, they may be things that we want to consider. The last thing that I think would be more difficult to implement in Amherst is an eviction moratorium. The city of Somerville actually has an eviction moratorium that I believe came into place before the state's eviction moratorium and continues even though the state's eviction moratorium has ended. Uh, while I, on the one hand, I could say, I would like to see town council adopt something like that. I mean, Somerville adopted that back in March or April after a lot of consideration. And so uh, I'm not sure that uh, it makes sense at this point to ask town council to adopt something like that, although it may. Uh, so there are a number of things that uh, uh, Somerville, Cambridge and Boston have done, possibly other localities that Amherst could consider. Um, and uh, Pat, I'll resend the memo of things that, of these ideas that I did send to town council. Uh, actually, I think I resent it to both Lynn and Paul as well. Uh, but, you know, it just adds something else to a group that has a lot on its plate. 
as you suggested earlier before we were recording. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but this is important too, so. Yeah, okay, well, let me go on to the uh, agenda item that we skipped. I see Kevin Noonan is here. So Nate, if you could add Kevin in and that'll give us a chance to hear from him uh, about what's happening with the seasonal shelter or shelters in Amherst as Kevin, you're, of you're November a, 1. Yeah, Kevin, you're a panelist now, so you can unmute yourself and start your video if you have that. Uh, okay, I think there it is. Hi, how are you? Thanks for joining uh, us, Kevin. I, I just had this Twilight Zone experience. I went to your email, John, I clicked on the link and I ended up in the CPA meeting. And I kept saying, where the hell oh, is going? I don't know why. Was it I do know thing? why, because I, I, I went to the CPA meeting earlier today and I may have given you the wrong link. It's okay. They, they seem like nice people. I do know Sarah Marshall, but uh, nobody else has no idea what these people are talking about. And it was all about money. <laughs> so thank you for the invitation. So you had asked me to talk about Craig stores, the changes that have gone on. Is that, can you see me? Is it okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so the Baptist church with COVID-19, the Baptist church wasn't big enough and we just didn't have the space. So we uh, shopped around and, uh, you know, talk about twilight zone experiences. I was negotiating with the Emmanuel Lutheran and in the middle of it, the pastor asked me to meet with the, uh, with the uh, executive committee and he never sent the link and I kept texting him asking him, the poor man died at the age of 48 or 47, I don't know. It was just like, wow, <laughs> this can't get any worse. But finally the Unitarian uh, Society of Amherst did come forward and, and say that unanimously the board voted to do it. And it's a beautiful room, if any of you have ever been in it, it's where we have the community breakfast every Wednesday. And, uh, but we can only fit about 14 beds in there. Uh, we were hoping for 16, but there just isn't enough space there either with the six foot separation. And then we were able to rent the uh, uh, University Lodge, the University Motor Lodge, I think it was formerly called, and, uh, and owned by Kurt Shumway in the Hampshire Hospitality Group. And that's up on at 345 North Pleasant Street, right sort of where North Pleasant Triangle and East Pleasant all converge at that rotary. And that's going pretty well. I got a text from Kurt the other day saying, how's it going? And, uh, Seems quiet from my perspective. And we said, yeah, it looks like a busy hotel. That's all, uh, or motel. Uh, people are, you know, we've had people tell me that they haven't slept in a bed in five years or are just so honored to be in there. Uh, one guy uh, had been had been homeless about a year. He's out raking. Uh, I said, you know, they have a company that comes to do that. The hotel does that. And he just wanted to show his appreciation. So, so far, so good. So there was, it, it, the, the motel was also useful because, um, the health department wanted us to have a negative COVID-19 test result before we let people into the congregate site. But they did uh, make a concession on the uh, motel. So because if someone were positive, where would you send them? I mean, back out to the streets or can you get them to Everett? To this, uh, I don't know if you saw the article today in the paper that the only uh, quarantine site is in Everett. It's about a hundred miles away, um, probably not far from Somerville. Um, Anyway, so uh, we um, have an assistant climbing up here with me, so she'll probably get into the picture pretty soon. Um, anyway, we, um, <laughs> there you go. We, uh, what was I talking about? <laughs> I'm totally <laughs> distracted by this cat. Uh, we are grateful that we have this motel and so far so good. Uh, we, we are prioritizing women and elderly in the motel and uh, or those with special needs and uh, you know someone some mental health problems or something like that um, and then everybody else is down at the uh, at the at the uh, Unitarian meeting house there we have 14 beds we've prioritized nine for men and five for women and then if, if all the women's beds are not filled we we conditionally allocate those to men but uh, uh, so there's only about two women down there uh, that wouldn't, that either didn't want to go to the motel or we didn't want to bring them there because uh, of past behaviors. So, uh, that, so it's just down to two. And then tonight I was told that we're full all together there. And we've got one, one room left at the motel. So I don't know what we're going to do when, when we're full all over, but uh, um, that's a problem because in the middle of the winter, especially in the middle of the pandemic, 
mean, this is a blessing to have a motel in the middle of a pandemic, but it's also going to be a real frustration when uh, when there isn't any more space, and uh, and there's no resolution yet with Northampton as to what they're doing with their. They can't use the high school like they did last year, so uh, they're finding some other hotel, I guess, or some church maybe. I, I, they haven't announced it yet, but uh, they're hoping to find some space that they can use. Kevin, how, how many, many spaces are there? That's what you can, how many spaces are there in the motel? Twenty rooms. And 20 so, rooms. if there's if there was an existing relationship, we allowed people to double up. So we have a father and a son uh, and two couples. So that adds uh, three more, uh, yeah. And I don't think there are any others. Oh, there's one potentially uh, the son of one of the women that lives there might might join her. So that would be 24 then total. But we we don't want to create really. We don't want people to say, oh yeah yeah we're 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 a couple. You know, no, we're not doing that because we we would be then unsure of what we're creating and who's behind that door and what what's going on there. You know. Uh, so yeah, and John, you had a question. I uh, no, Carol asked my question. Oh, there you um, go. So, do you also use the motel then, as if someone tests positive and they're in the UU social hall to move? No, they can't get into the UU without a negative test result. Oh, okay. The health director. So uh, that's solid. You can't do that, um, but. The, they will agree to let us put people in the motel if they've just had a test because they're individual rooms and you know they can shut the door and have their own bathroom and uh, so uh, but if anybody tests positive in either site there we would contact MEMA through the command center the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency and they would be offered a, a ride to Everett to this motel in Everett and uh, they would remain there for I think it's 10 or 14. I think it's 10. I think quarantine is 14, but 10 is for whatever, until they produce a negative test result. Um, they would stay there. And also if so someone needs quarantining once we're full, um, they can also go to Everett provided they've had a test. The problem with that is that the results come back in 24 to 48 hours. So you, you could be shipped down hundred miles down the turnpike and then, you know, the day after tomorrow, okay, you're done. See you. And they'll send you back. So but you know, it's better than nothing. And uh, the Quality Inn in Northampton was the MEMA site, but they wouldn't, at that time, they wouldn't let anybody in except COVID positive cases. And that was a real frustration because we could have sent a whole bunch of people over there just to be sheltered. So the motel over in Northampton sat there for a better part of the summer with nobody there in it. So MEMA decided to close the one there and to close the one in Pittsfield and Lexington, I think was the other one. And uh, now they're, they only have the Everett facility. And, and you, know, you guys all know that if, you know, if you're in Boston, then there's Boston, there's 495, and there's the Pacific Ocean. Anything in between is you know, flyover country. You know, so, uh, we, we, it's hard to get Boston's attention. For, but we do really need a regional uh, place for people to quarantine and, and, and isolate. A year ago, you had some space at Hampshire College, I believe. I guess that's right. changed. It's not possible now that the college well, is Well, yeah, you're right. It, 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 they were not open when it, they sent everybody home. And so uh, the town manager is a, an alum and the president is uh, you know, is doing what he can to cooperate with the town. And uh, it wasn't needed because we tested everybody on April 29th and there were no no staff, no 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 guests. And that thank thank God that there, there was no one who tested positive. So we of course immediately asked, can we have that site anyway? And the answer was no. no. <laughs> and uh, then we asked for Wildwood School and the answer was no. But uh, and now all of those are, they're they're not in the play right now because all that well was resuming, I believe, and and uh, and Hampshire's resumed already. So. Now, whether there's going to be any wiggle room over the period of time uh, when they leave, because I think most schools are cutting short or curtailing their their semesters, so that people leave, uh, you know, around Thanksgiving and don't come back till February, that'd be great. But I, I don't know that there's any plan to do that. Lincoln Apartments also uh, on Lincoln Avenue, I think, are being used by UMass for quarantine and isolation, but they're not extending that to anyone. From the people from the community that we serve, it's only 
uh, people from the UMass student body and faculty, I believe. I don't even know if that's faculty. May, may, you may know that, I don't know. Do you know? No, I don't. Um, can I do a question? Are you at capacity sure. right now between the two sites? We're at capacity at the UU tonight for the first time since yeah. November 1st. And we have one room left at the motel, which will probably get filled tomorrow. So that's gonna be a problem as we move forward because there's nothing anywhere else to put them. You know. right. Well, Kevin, and I wanna say congr congratulations yeah, on opening two sites. Thank you. Yes, it's been <laughs> a little nerve wracking, but it, we got it done. Yeah. I think that's great. I mean, there was some doubt in my mind at, at various points in this process, especially when we hadn't wrapped it up with the negotiations with the UU. They had a beautiful congregational conversation or whatever you want to call it. And uh, like 99% of the people who were there were speaking in favor of it. And uh, it was very, very moving. I've also been a member there for 29 years, but uh, um, you know, in this case, I was the petitioner. And so, right. But people who are associated with the UU and the Community Breakfast really value it and want to expand the role. So we really appreciate their stepping up. That's great. Do you have staffing issues with having to maintain two sites? Yeah, any of you guys want to work the overnight shift? We, <laughs> we're looking for overnight people. Uh, yeah, we're, 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 we're ramping up. Um, it just you know takes a while to get it done because we're a seasonal shelter or have been up till now. Um, we, are, uh, we have to rehire new people each, each season. The other thing to note is that the UU is only closed through May. So once they reopen, there's no room for a shelter program in their social hall. So we're going to have, and, and I think uh, Pat and I have had some conversations around this. We need to find a more permanent site because I mean, we all agree that church spaces or congregation spaces aren't really appropriate for shelters anymore, especially with COVID. Uh, so we need to find a more permanent site. Where that's gonna be, I have no idea. What funds can we get? If you're having trouble spending all your money, can you uh, reallocate it to help us with this particular issue? <laughs> We'd like to spend the money on finding places for your folks to live permanently, Kevin. That'd be perfect. But right now that your program doesn't extend to people who are homeless, right? No, it, or have you changed that? No, I mean, we, we don't control any housing right now, but we do our best to support people who are developing housing you know, like Valley no, but I thought that the program that you're the, that you set up recently only applies to people who are in danger of losing their housing. We, you and I conversed about that. I oh yeah, the, the emergency program. rental assistance program, right, right is one. limited yeah. to people who are at risk of losing their housing. But do you think that might change with you folks at some point if it's not if you're not able to spend all the money you've got? Um, not immediately. Okay. Again, I think Whaling has applied through Amherst Community Connections to the Community Preservation Act Committee for funds to continue to provide rental assistance that she has in the past. Right. Um, and we supported that. Uh, so I don't know, may maybe we'll at some point find a way to make that kind of program more permanent in Amherst. Well, we have uh, 14 rapid rehousing subsidies that we're gonna try and get people out of these places. And wow. Free up space. But again, we're ramping up trying to hire the people we need to do that. Um, so maybe I need to get together with Tom to find out how, how Raft is doing. And if they've got 20 people down there, maybe we can tap into that as well. Uh, 20 offices or 20 people? I had heard 20 uh, new staff, but uh, I had just met with their new executive director about a month ago. And, and he was talking, he was taking me on a tour of his new facility that he inherited when he came in and uh, yeah that's beautiful he space. pointed yeah. to all these offices that were supposedly originally going to be used to house his development team and uh, he said of course they can't move in there now because we need it all for our emergency right. assistance folks so hey i've got a question kevin yes sir number one um i know you were kind of joking but um you know I, for one, would be willing to uh, volunteer for a night. Um, I don't know That'd how often, but uh, I think if we could get the word out uh, that we need that. Um, yeah, it's it's something. Yeah. I, I, I don't know how often I could do it, but. 
you know, and they do require all of us. They also do require us to have a COVID test first. So, but yeah, right. that's not hard. We can send well, you over to the COVID test for that. And if, yeah, if they can give you the test results within uh, less than a week. Um, no, I think we get them like within but, uh, 48 hours. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Kevin, if you can send me a call for volunteers, I'd be absolutely, absolutely. Uh, willing to send it out to my own mailing list. I, I dropped my pen just before that question came up. So now, <laughs> but I will, I will, I know how to get a hold of John and, and you okay. can forward it to Tom as well. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah. no, send it out to the whole, you know, I think, well, yeah, well, I'm, I'm obviously yeah. not going to fulfill the whole need but uh you can get it broadly distributed um, yeah i bet there's yeah. a lot of people in the community who would be willing to give up uh, a night a month or well that's the way it always was at the cot shelter over in northampton and right. we had that same thing going on at the baptist church in the earlier right. days but right. when covid came we lost a ton of volunteers uh, we also lost all the food that we used to get from umass the, uh, really? the students oh. ran this thing called the food recovery network well, first of all, there's not that many students. And then second of all, UMass Dining Commons isn't isn't permitting any food to go out anymore. You're talking of, about I guess because prepared of food, right? Yeah, food that they didn't, like in the Blue Wall or the Berkshire yeah. Dining Commons that they didn't serve. We used to get that and it was yeah. damn good. Very nice stuff. In fact, I think UMass has a good reputation for campus food. Yeah. So we used to be the beneficiaries of that. Well, now there's it's nothing. We got nothing anymore. And we've asked Amherst College and no luck there. And, Hampshire College, I think they would just take your order and make it that day since there's so few people. <laughs> so they don't have a lot of waste. Yeah. But yeah, there's it's a, unfortunate. There's a group nationally you must have heard of run by this uh, na internationally famous chef who. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. The Spanish guy? Jose uh, Andres. Yes. Yeah, the guy from yeah. Spain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I should probably try to get next to him and see. No, we're not next <laughs> well, to him. Well, I don't know. But Contact him and find out. <laughs> I don't know yeah. if there's any local branch of that work, but you're right. I know, like Rachel's, <laughs> I know Rachel's tables handing, I mean, I was down at one of our properties today and they were handing out these big boxes of food, but it's, it's not prepared. You know, it's a gallon yeah. of milk and a yeah. bag of potatoes and right. probably yeah. not what you were exactly looking for. But, no, that doesn't hurt. But uh, yeah, yeah. We, we use the food bank too for stuff like that for the bulk. Yeah. But the, there's a danger of the USDA food now is being cut uh, as of December 31st. So wow, that's going to hurt. Yeah. yeah. In fact, the so, food bank is asking people to send letters to their, their legislators. So just one other question. It's a sort of a policy question, Kevin. If, if you could use the money to develop permanent supportive housing, or support shelters, right? Yeah. Where would well, you permanent put support of housing is, is always better. Housing is always better. Hotels are better than shelters. Shelters, uh, housing, permanent housing is better than a motel. Um, okay. So yeah, that's the best. Yeah. But there's a couple of problems in Amherst. One is available land, but maybe yeah. we can use the football field behind 132 uh, uh, Northampton Road. <laughs> I don't know. They don't seem to be using it, but um, yeah. Uh, Land is a problem and cost in a town like this. Uh, yeah. It's very expensive, yeah. very expensive. Is, and and most right. developers don't want to do affordable housing. And we've had yeah. examples of, you know, all up and down North Pleasant Street where I don't think yeah. one single unit of affordable housing is yeah. in any of those units. Yeah. I don't know how that but happened, if, but it did. But if you added up all the visits to the emergency rooms and all the other sure. social sure. costs associated with taking care of the homeless, I think you'd find that it's cost effective. Yeah, absolutely. Supportive housing. Yeah. Absolutely. It's far better. But uh, unfortunately, in the New England winters, when there's no, yeah. No, yeah. no option for that, right. then, you know, and it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse with the eviction moratorium uh, yeah. ending yeah. on October 17th. So it's going to be, you know, we're just starting to see new people that we've never heard of before. But we don't know if that's because of the eviction moratorium. We haven't really had a chance to do the intake mm -hmm. and find out how they got there. But uh, Mm. It's going to get worse before it gets better. Kevin, in addition to um, putting out a call for volunteers, is there something else that the Housing Trust could do to try to support the work that you're doing with Craig Stores? Well, keep us posted on whether or not you change the regs, because uh, we could maybe if, if we could get first, last and security out of you folks, that would be a start for Tom's point. We can get people into an apartment and maybe have... And, and, and one of the things that's hard to do with the government sources, it's hard to get shared living arrangements, but we might be able to do that with some people, not all, but 
uh, you know, to make it more affordable, like and the, treat them as though they were student housing. You know what I mean? Uh, up to four people can stay in a, in a unrelated can stay into in, in a unit. So maybe that would help, but you know, we have to be careful about who. And the other problem is with our population, we're a low threshold shelter. So we're taking people who are addicted or um, mentally ill in some cases. So you can't just give them a key to an apartment necessarily and say, I hope you all get along. I think Wei Ling did try that on, 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 on uh, Route 9 there, uh, Amherst Road or whatever it's called, Belchertown Road. Yeah. And then it closed because you know you, you, she didn't have the supervision. And I think one guy lit a chair on fire and went out to do some shopping somewhere and practically burned the place down. And another guy got in a knife fight with somebody else. So you really do need supervision. Uh, and I don't, I don't mean to disparage the people we serve. They're all very nice, but they do need to have somebody kind of watching the store. That's our covenant with them. You sleep, we watch. So, but uh, yeah, but, but if you're dealing with sober housing, you know, like I don't know if you're familiar with the Oxford House model. Uh, if you have a group of people who are staying sober and want to live together, that would be ideal for the kind of thing I'm proposing. Yeah, you might consider. Um, I, I have some experience with a house in North Carolina that that this eight guys live together, and they're exempt under the um, uh, ADA. Uh, so they can they can have more people and it's people who are staying sober and if they show up not sober then they are, they are asked to leave immediately and they can come back but they have to get sober again you know but you know not not tomorrow but you know they have to go to a program or whatever you know kevin, you so that would you that would help some, kevin you mentioned you have some rapid rehousing uh is it vouchers or do you um do you find that you can house people in amherst or is it usually outside well, we haven't actually filled one yet, uh, but we tried to use the uh, the, the uh, fair market rental rate mm -hmm. and we put it into the budget. But the other uh, concern, but they keep reassuring us, is the state has not actually finalized our contract because in the middle of all this contract negotiation came the uh, decision to pursue funding from FEMA. So they're now going to ask us to also get reimbursed for the shelter expenses and the motel expenses by FEMA. And so they can conserve their ESG um, dollars for other things. The upshot of that is that we still don't have a contract. And we called them the other day and said, you know, we're going to run out of money soon. So can you send us a cash advance or something? And they, they're working on it. But uh, it's a real concern. So we don't actually have those subsidies yet in place because uh, we don't have a finalized contract with them. But they were based on the fair market rate in Amherst mm -hmm. for one bedroom or two bedroom. Uh, we aren't going to have that many two bedrooms, but a, a studio or a one bedroom, we, we could have that. Does anybody else have any questions or comments for Kevin? Or the cat, if, you, if you'd like. Or the cat. Yeah. <laughs> she's, she's, it's like when my kids were small, if they saw me with a newspaper, they would just jump in my lap. This cat, she sees me sitting in a chair. There she is. Kevin, it almost looks like a skunk when you first picked it up. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. Could... She's, she's about 15. <laughs> she, speaking of affordable housing, she was, uh, I worked on a project when I worked at Open Pantry called uh, by, uh, 30, 32 Byers Street. And that's where we got her. She was hanging around, in, you know, right next to the, where the Springfield Armory is. And there's a, a lot of open space there. And she was hanging around that, that housing project that we built. Yeah. Well, yeah. thanks very much for joining Thank us, you. Kevin. And my Thank apologies you. for sending you the wrong link. No, it was just it was it's just been a bad thing. week for that for me. And then I didn't know how to how to ask the question. Like, am I in the right room? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, and I don't even know if they noticed I was there, so I finally left. <laughs> After I got Nate's message saying, "Hey, where are you?" <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you all. I appreciate the work you do. So, thank you, yeah. Kevin, for yeah. all the work that you're doing. And Rita, I haven't seen you since town meeting. Didn't we used to sit next to each other and tell me, you and your husband? I think so. Good to see you. Take care. Bye. Thanks, Bye -bye. Kevin. Okay. Um, so now we're going to move on to the third major item uh, on our agenda, which is reviewing and updating the Housing Trust Strategic Plan. Um, I do want to be sure that we leave time to go into executive session um, so I think we'll take this conversation as far as we can. It may require some more thought on us, on our parts. And so we may not be able to finish it this evening, but nonetheless, let's get started. And 
uh, Erica and Rita, um, do you wanna go over the major points? I do appreciate your sending out the information in advance. And actually, I think it's pretty accessible, but I'll let you both talk about this. Sure, Erica, do you wanna start? Would you rather have me start? Um, well, my question is more of a process question because uh, we do have the one pager, which I believe was um, sort of compiled and we went over it last time. Um, but the process question is, uh, Rita did a great job. She actually bought a converter from PDF to Word. Um, so she can put the information in there um, so you could see it exactly where it exists and it's much more concrete than having a one pager. Um, so I don't know if you wanna go through the pages or you just wanna do an overview. So that's the question. I mean, have, if people have had an opportunity to read it, I think you know, we could go through it and see what people think in terms of our uh, additions. Um, I think there aren't that many pages. No. I think that the main substance of what you're uh, recommending is really stretched out across about two pages. Or exactly. Maybe um, so I think we should talk about uh, what you've got uh, kind of line by line or goal by goal or something like that. Sure. Um, because the things that are at the back of the document um, uh, really are, well, I won't say irrelevant, but um, creating a new long range budget for the housing trust um, would depend in part on what we decide about these goals. Right. So there's no right. point in jumping there tonight. Okay. All right. Well, if you want to go straight to page four, um, we decided, or we decide to recommend. So these are all just recommendations, and it's up to the group to make a decision. Um, but to add goal number four, identify and secure funding resources. And I think um, I, mean, I can just tell you from my point of view in reading this, um, and also looking, I actually looked at Cambridge where they actually had quote unquote, an endowment. Um, and, you know, obviously we're in a different place than Cambridge and Harvard was the one that provided the endowment. We also have Amherst College. I know Hampshire is, is financially in a bind, but looking at how to create enough funding where we have our own independence and we can, you know, think about how to utilize that funding. So um, goal number seven, we thought was important to add and to think about that what are the different ways that we can actually create a larger fund and not be so dependent on this, the CPC or, or other um, more restrictive funding? Um, Rita, did you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, no, I think it's, it is really about recognizing that without um, funding and a secure source of funding, either through an endowment or um, routine awards of, of CPA money, the, the trust just survives from year to year about, um, you know, fi financially. So this is to try to think long-term, longer range about how to capitalize um, the, the trust so it can do more. Rita, that, have, you, Eric, have you sent me that quickly? I, I'm having trouble finding, I don't know if, could you, then I could share it. Uh, on Zoom if you want. Yes, I can't find it either. I thought I had it, but it's just the clean PDF. Of I think the Nate, you sent it to us. Plan. That would be great because I can't find it either. So you, you, you want me to send the, 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 the current one or the, you know, the marked? It has know. the additions to it. Uh, and the I think ones that they're, yeah, yeah, the one they're talking about. Right, right. Nate, you sent oh. it out um, because I had to find it too. <laughs> Um, so I, th I believe it was in your email, Nate. But I, you know, I thought you had made changes. I'm not, I can't find the, some, the what redlined. you did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there was a redlined version. Yeah. That... Yeah, let me see if I can find it. Um, okay, I'm just, I'm Nate. operating off of a laptop. I'd have to switch right. computers. <laughs> Nate, I sent you something earlier today, which okay. were my detailed plan for the meeting. Yeah. And that included a page or slightly over a page maybe two pages that summarized uh, this material. Um, it was a redline version, John. Remember you had asked me to do a redline right. version of the, and so. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, you know, I have what I have and, cause I pulled out 
um, what you did. And uh, let me see if I can find it. And we, you know, I, uh, it's interesting. Yeah, I had emailed Jen and I never heard um, back from her. So I just did a conversion on the PDF yeah. to a Word document and then I did a red line version. I mean, I can go, I just have to. No, no, that's fine. I think, you know, I think Jen uses like InDesign or something. And so yeah, it was, it was easy enough to do. Okay. I, I got it into a Word document and then I did, uh, you know, I edited within the Word document. Right, I don't have I, the I just found it. I found it. It's an email from John from Friday, November 6th. And it has, it's the trust action plan with edits. Right. And that has the red line. Okay. You want to send it to Nate? And you can yes. send it out. That's yeah, fine. I look through my, I, yeah, I'm not finding it in my email. I don't. I'm not either. I can't. What I notice is if I go into my email, I'm going to have to get out of Zoom. <laughs> Francis, were you able to send it to Nate? Thanks. Yeah, John, I, was, I was trying to search by keyword too and nothing was coming up. I don't know. Um, um, it was one of four attachments that I sent yep. uh, a week or so ago to everybody. On November 6th, did you say? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> something like that. I, I, I... There were a lot of emails from you, John. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's a lot going on, Erica. What can I say? And, and let me tell you, every email I appreciate. But I actually did want to piggyback on the fact that goal number seven, if we don't have an independent, to some extent, uh, endowment, we have to depend on someone as dynamic as John to go in front of the CPAC and to constantly advocate for money. And so yeah. if we lose a leader like John, you know, that, that's the other piece. So is to try to create enough of stability for us that you know, if we go through a transition where we either don't have a you know the CPAC that is very sure generous for others, um, you know, we'll have lean years. Well, I appreciate that, Erica, and it's not that I disagree. I think adding that goal is a great idea. On the other hand, I think I see it as something we need to do, in addition to uh, relying on Community Preservation Act money. I mean, right now we're probably getting something in the neighborhood of half a million dollars a year in CPA money yeah. um, between, uh, and I don't mean the trust is, I mean money that they're spending on community housing. Right. Um, our strategic planning consultant, Jen Goldson, said that we should try to negotiate an agreement with CPAC in which they give us the authority to determine all community housing spending under a fixed budget. But even if we had that authority, and even if it was as much as a half a million dollars a year, honestly, that wouldn't be sufficient for the goals that at least I personally would like to see. It would be about 50%. So we need, as you say, to be have additional sources of funding um, that go beyond what we can get from Community Preservation Act funds. I absolutely agree with that. Um, where we get that, how we go about it, is not something that uh, I have any immediate ideas about, though. So one of the things that is in uh, the strategic plan that I saw is, is that there's a uh, proposal of an annual, all of us getting together and really thinking through uh, and strategizing. So it's something to consider. This, this is just our recommendation in adding this to the strategic plan, but it also, there's a existing recommendation that yearly that we come together and really think about those goals and you know have they changed? Um, do we need to do more strategizing regarding the speci specificity of the goals? So just as a reminder. Okay, so next, um, before you turn to that page, actually at the bottom of page four, one of the other areas that we thought was important was right there, um, was to update um, because there, there's a lot in the strategic plan that has been addressed. And so to give, um, you know, ourselves that credit uh, in updating um, those areas. Um, I think it'd be worth you know, considering uh, making those updates. So go ahead, you can go to the next page. Let me just stop for a minute, Erica, and just ask if anybody disagrees with the idea that we should make it a priority to uh, identify other sources of funding. 
Yeah, I think I was on a I was on a call or a workshop, and people I forget what, which one. But people were talking about you know how you know how to get money, but then people were talking about right land donation or other other possibilities for resources. And I just think that you know, John, you do a lot of outreach with other communities, but it would be good if we had if we did meet periodically to discuss that and had other ideas because you know, just as we are witnessing with the CPA now, you know, if we were making a big request, but then the CPA also is becoming more competitive, we can't, we may not be able to rely on that as a funding source uh, when it's needed. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to bankroll a lot of money. You know, even if we had local banks that were willing to lend, I mean, at some point, you know, the trust can incur debt or other things. So, you know, is there, you know, are there programs that we could use or you know, ways to leverage things if we needed to um, outside of traditional bonding by the town. You know, those are things that we haven't explored as a trust yet, but. Yeah, well, we can certainly consult with Shelly Gering of MHP. Um, she would be familiar with what other uh, town trusts, housing trusts have done around the state. Um, I'm not sure I've had that conversation with her, but if I haven't, um, I'm certainly willing to do that now. Yep. Okay, great. Um, so FY 2022 um, was pretty much trying to reflect some of the things that you know we have discussed and we've incorporated. So number seven, just adding, um, you know, establishing new or expanding existing rental and ownership housing assistant research how to improve access to existing programs. So that sort of reflects some of the work that we're currently doing. And so just to make it more specific and reflective, um, I don't know if it's useful for me to read all of these. You can read them yourself. Um, well, let's take them one by one, Eric, and okay. see if people have comments on them. Yep. So number seven. Uh, sorry, for uh, number 11, explore opportunities for conservation-based development. Um, what, what do we mean by conservation-based development? Rita, do you want to address that? Sure. Yeah. Um, basically, you know, Amherst has been uh, pretty ambitious about um, acquiring open space and using CPA funds and sometimes a combination of CPA and other funds. And when the town is, is doing that, can we look at such as with, um, I think it's, it's Hickory Ridge, can a part um, of that parcel of whatever's acquired then be dedicated for housing? So that you're combining, and it has been done in the past in Amherst, I, way back in the early days, um, I believe it was Misty Meadows, which was a home ownership development. Um, it was part of a larger conservation um, acquisition and then a piece of property over there was dedicated for first time home buyers. So um, uh, that's what we mean by conservation based development. Yeah, you're looking, Thanks. you're looking at a piece of property that has uh, some frontage on uh, on a road and hopefully it's a road that uh, is a major road in town or uh, one that might have access to buses or whatever public transportation we have. Uh, the city of Northampton has done this. I know I've talked occasionally to Dave Zomack about it and he is interested in principle, but I'm not sure he's identified uh, a property yet, which we could do this, with the exception of Hickory Ridge, as Rita just mentioned. I think, you know, the other thing I'd like to say is that it seems like landowners are excited mm -hmm. to um, put land in conservation. I think, you know, there's been a lot written about that in terms of benefits and maybe tax write-offs. And I feel like there hasn't been as much of a promotion about, you know, you can get some of the same benefits if you partner and put it into affordable housing as well. And so, um, you know, I think it's a, it's a win-win and I think it's something that, you know, just needs more promotion, whether it's a policy directive or if it's just something that needs more education, you know, an outreach to landowners, um, is it something that, you know, we did it with Hawthorne too, on a much smaller scale as a habit, you know, habitat to two homes, but, you know, I, I agree. I feel like there could be opportunities where landowners have you know, land where a lot of it could be conservation, but a, a fair amount could also be for housing. And is there a way to have, 
um, even create a small subdivision, John, on land, you know, not just having frontage, but even if there's enough, uh, you know, enough to have uh, mm -hmm. you know, put a road in, I mean, um, so yeah, I think, um, I think that's a, I think that's a one interesting opportunity. So if you look from seven to 11, they're probably our strongest recommendations. So um, like research how to improve access to existing programs as our subcommittee is doing some of that work. Um, and then um, John, you just, you know, also talked today about possibly using the money um, that we had for our program to help and assist people to get into existing programs. So these are, it's just reflective of what we've actually been talking about. The number eight, um, and I might just recommend to just state uh, pandemics or disasters versus specifically COVID because there's gonna be another disaster pandemic um, that we're going to probably have to deal with in the future. But it's to really reflect the fact that um, you know, we, we also recognize that there's an opportunity to you know, develop and support programmatically legislative and policy housing to mitigate effects of a disaster or a, a pandemic on low moderate income households. And that's exactly what the program is that we've developed to do. Um, explore new existing re revenues. We just talked about that. Wait, 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 Erica, let's stop with number eight and ask oh, if people have comments on it. Sorry. It's okay. Um, I mean, I have a comment. I like the way that you're broadening it because I felt like just talking about COVID-19, which hopefully won't be with us for more than another year or so, was too narrow. Yeah. Um, so if we're talking about uh, dealing with emergencies or disasters, that, that actually makes better sense to me in terms of how to formulate a goal like this. Yep. Yeah, Matt. Yeah, and I like it. It goes hand in hand with the conversation mm -hmm. we had tonight about, you know, is are there, you know, like the pledge to for you know to not evict from landlords, and are there, you know, would we have a suite of tools that we could implement if something were to happen? So, you know, if it's familiar, if it can be, you know, outreached easily, then, and it could be more effective. So, you know, some of these are, you know, what we're doing with the rental assistance program is, kind of, a, you know, the town's first time doing it, and. Same with uh, you know business relief programs. We're kind of you know reinventing things or trying it again for the first time in 15 years. But if you know if it becomes something that we have you know documented well and we can go back to it pretty easily, it would, that'd be really helpful. Okay, uh, number nine we just talked about. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to read it. It's just really more stability in terms of our funding and thinking about financially st financial stability for the next five years, and looking at other resources. So number 10, um, it was actually written throughout here, um, but just to more uh, focus on the, the zoning bylaws, because it seems like the zoning bylaws could have a huge impact on creating more affordable housing. Um, so to impact that um, in, you know, in the next two years, trying to have an impact on that. And I think we were going to research. There's, um, Rita helped me with this. There was a woman who actually did some research on it in terms of zoning bylaws. And we were going to look into what she found. She did an analysis of it. Amy, right? I think it's Amy Dane's study, right? That yeah. was someone else. Judy Barrett. Barrett. Oh, okay. Yeah. So Judy Barrett had done some work for the town and um, I think, you know, what, what Eric and I talked about with this one is, as Erica pointed out, the zoning um, has a big impact on the production of affordable units in town. And there is inclusionary zoning, but it hasn't seemed to, you know, because of um, the way it's, it's written, a lot of new development has not had any affordable units included. And so it's something that the trust, you know, shouldn't be taking on itself. Obviously it's within the purview of um, the planning board, but to work cooperatively and maybe Rob has some ideas, uh, but to revisit this with town staff and the planning board about what the, what the trust's interests are. I would, I would wonder if, if people who have more experience, Pat or Carol or John, Nate, 
I remember all the struggles we went through trying to get <coughs> zoning changes through the town meeting. Does anybody think it's going to be easier with town council? Oh, uh, a lot easier. No, <laughs> I think the um, well, it can't get harder, but you know. the um, yeah, you know, it I could, I, Tom. <laughs> at it one could. of the previous trust meetings, you know, I think I I had said I would work with Rob to write a letter to the planning uh, board about different zoning measures, and I'm it's still on my my list. And I agree, I think zoning is a really powerful tool. It's it's not just inclusionary zoning; it's also you know how the town defines apartments right now and how it's permitted makes it really limited for different multifamily types of development of where and how it can be developed. So, you know, and there's other ones too. So I, I think it could be, you know, I read mean, it's interesting. I, I, not that the trust wouldn't write the zoning, but I think the trust would have to be a big proponent of it to mm -hmm. encourage the planning board to investigate it. So, you know, with this whole 4DR for instance, it's been, you know, a year and a half or two years with 4DR Granted, it was extended because of COVID, but you know, just recently the planning board, after the last presentation, now some planning board members are saying, I think 4DR might actually be worthwhile to pursue, but it, it took a year and a half <laughs> uh, to get there. And so I think, you know, for the next few years, it may be um, that the trust can help outline, you know, priorities in terms of zoning changes. So, you know, I uh, staff had done that a few years ago, and I think it, we could revisit it and strengthen it. So I do, I do think that is really important. You know, um, some that, of it is, if, you know, if there's a citizen petition, for instance, to change inclusionary zoning, you know, what does the trust, you know, the planning board might say, what does the trust think about that? And if we've already outlined a position, then mm -hmm. we're ready to go. You know, even if we have some ideas about how we think inclusionary zoning could work better, I just, you know, once it gets into the petition or something happens, it's like, you know, we're almost retroactive trying to work with it, but it'd be great if we right, got something out there first. And Yeah, what I would say is that, um, you know, for some folks, it'd be a fairly sharp learning curve. And, you know, perhaps if there was a, not the entire trust, but if there was a subcommittee, you know, a few people, um, trust members who are willing to work on this and perhaps have some of your time. And I know Rob is, um, has a lot of expertise, so maybe he's willing to to step up, but to kind of sh shape some um, policy suggestions about how the zoning might um, be friendlier right. for multifamily production. I'm so happy to help with that. I've um, I've done my my fair share of looking at different zoning and how it helps or does not help. Um, creation of housing. I also think that there's there's a little bit of an impetus now with Cambridge finally being able to pass the affordable housing overlay district um, that basically covers the entire city. I know that Somerville's starting to do it now too because Cambridge is doing it. Um, so I also think that there's potential possibility and it of course takes a lot of time to change zoning but once you change it um, it's it takes a long time, but I think the change can happen there. Um, I, I remember it was enormously frustrating watching that process with the planning board going to the town meeting and getting shot down because they didn't have the super majority and it just, uh, people felt like it was, you know, almost, you know, not worth the effort to try to get any uh, changes to the zoning, but if there's really is a um, uh, perception that there'll be an easier path now, um, I think it'd be great. 40B is not enforceable here, right? You can't override the ZBA. So if there was a real concerted intentional plan mm -hmm. to uh, make affordable housing um, as of right, uh, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. Just to come back to 40R for a minute, it was Rita and I with the support of the Housing Trust that wrote the grant proposal with assistance from Nate to Mass Housing Finance to get support for consultants to come in and work with the town on 40R. As Nate suggested, it has not been an easy process. And part of the reason it hasn't been an easy process is 
to be honest, it's not clear who's on first. Um, it's not clear to me that the planning board remains in charge of our zoning bylaws. Uh, I believe at some point the town council said, oh, we want the community resources committee to do the work on developing zoning bylaws, not the planning board. Now, Pat, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but to me at the moment, there's a, some confusion about who's in charge or who's really tasked with the development of changes to the zoning bylaws at this there's, point in time. There's a lot of confusion right now. We have a um, retreat on Saturday and one of the um, agenda items is um, council committees versus committees, council committee versus the planning board and the zoning board um, and who, who should be doing that work. Um, and so right now, and I was going to bring up CRC, which is called Community Resource Committee. Um, and I feel like it interfered also with the affordable housing um, proposals mm -hmm. uh, for affordable housing plans that you had generated. Um, and so, um, you know, if you wanted to participate in that meeting, it's a public, it's an open meeting. Um, that might be very helpful to talk about some of the kind of um, chaos that's been created by a council <laughs> committee taking the responsibility from the committee that was is really charged with the work. So, well, since I've already butted heads with some of the people who are responsible for that, I'm not sure I wanted to participate, <laughs> but I appreciate the invitation, well, Pat. Anything that you can send me uh, uh, around what you're thinking, John, would be helpful and I could use it on Saturday when we're having this conversation. Okay, thank you. Okay, so paying attention uh, to time, page 21, um, it's an update. First paragraph is just to really update. Um, we saw that, you know, the um, just to update it to ensure that it's clear that there was a merger that took place with the trust and that now operates with a nine board. It was just sort of clarification. So it's just on top of page 21, just on top, right there where the green is. Um, and so we don't have this in here, but it is one of our recommendations on the one page, which is the subcommittees or work groups to really sort of define um, some of the, the subcommittees and work groups and also the responsibility that if you make a decision to be part of the um, Amherst Municipal Housing Trust, that you actually agree to volunteer to work um, on a committee. Um, so that's sort of solidified. Um, so when you start off, you can read it right there what your commitment is as a member um, to participate in that and to maybe even um, identify some committees that you know, we might want to have as standing committees. Any Getting comments? with the f financing committee. Yes, that, that I, would be I like, absolutely. I like that. I was muted for a second. I, I do like that because um, it's kind of the expectation. So we're not, we're not, you know, we're not catching people off guard, thinking that oh, you know, I can join the trust and I can attend, you know, attend a monthly meeting, but that there is some expectation of additional work. So you know, we just, for instance, we just have three new members on the block grant committee, and. Um, you know, some of the members are saying, oh, well, it looks like you just kind of do work in the fall to get proposals ready and then that's it. I'm like, well, no, actually, you know, we have a public hearing in May and we may have to meet and reallocate funding and, you know, this and that. And they're like, oh, oh, okay. But I think that if they just looked recently at, you know, the calendar, they think it's only, you know, a three or four month commitment. Um, I mean, it is busy during those times. So same thing with the trust. I mean, I think everyone knows it's a standing um, border committee, but it'd be nice to think that, you know, there could be three or four working groups that they put their effort into. I, I do like that. There was something else that I read in here that I thought was really important that could also possibly be a committee and that is to create a communication strategy and package and toolkit. Um, I, I think, you know, a lot of us depend on John to get the information out and then he lets us know about the hearings and then we write, you know, our either our letters or, or we go to a hearing, but to actually have a strategy to keep uh, affordable housing on the radar constantly and toolkits and possible, you know, the quick messages that can be sent out or press releases or editorials. So, you know, 
that could be you know a committee as well uh, just to constantly keep it on the radar for Amherst residents how important this is. Okay, so the last one um, is the next page and this is just to update um, the five year budget. Um, so that was sort of our last recommendation um, for updating the strategic plan. And I, I agree, it'd be interesting to look at how we've actually spent money over the last five years uh, or three or four years, whatever it is that we could look at uh, because this was Jen Goldson's idea about what we should strive for. And quite honestly, I don't think that uh, uh, Housing Trust as it was assembled then ever really looked carefully into this. I mean, Tom, you were around then. Obviously, Nate was around. I don't know if anybody else was, but I, I don't think we really tried to pick apart what Jen had proposed. We just said, okay, looks good. Let's leave it in the plan. Rita, did I miss anything? No, I don't think so. That's that covers it. Well, I do want to move on to talking about uh, property acquisition, for which we need to move into executive session. I appreciate the work that Erica, you, and Rita have done on this. Um, so do you I want to vote on it, John, or is what's what will happen with the proposed revisions now? Well, um, or do you want to do that at the next meeting? I think we should do it at the next meeting. Um, there's, uh, again, uh, I think it was number eight, which we talked about broadening, not to make it so narrow that it just okay. reflects on COVID. Um, and now that we've had a little bit of discussion, people may be in a better position to vote on it if we bring it back to the next meeting. Right. So that's what I would feel comfortable doing at this point. And I, you know, just let you know, trust members know you can also email comments to me, and then I can you know shepherd them through to Rita and Erica. So, you know, if you have any other comments on this, um, you can always send me an email, and then we can look at it again one more time. Okay. So thanks again for your work on this. I think that what you propose are not really dramatic changes, but things we've been kind of moving in this direction, but it makes sense to try to codify it uh, as part of our public strategy for letting people know what the housing trust is, is wanting to do. So thank you. Okay, so now we need to move into executive session um, we have two attendees. Well, I think who... I, I sent a link out to a, another. So I think like last time, John, um, the trust voted uh, in public oh, to that's go right. into an executive session and then we closed this meeting and then I started the next meeting. And I'm going to leave and not participate in the executive session, so. Okay, and Pat, I'll add you to the trust uh, group email just to make sure, I'm not sure I have yet, but. Thank you very much, thank you. Yeah, I've been sending things to you because I sent it to everybody on town council. Yeah, I but just I, yeah, I want to make sure I'm, I'm going to do yeah. it. Okay, so I move that we end our regular meeting at this point in time, which is about 35 minutes after eight and move into executive session for the pur purpose of talking about the acquisition of property for affordable housing. And as I think I said last time, uh, we're doing this because uh, the information that we're talking about is confidential and it would affect the town's negotiating position or the trust negotiating position with respect to the seller of the property that we have in mind. So it's necessary that we end the public part of the meeting now. Uh, is there a second? I second it. Uh, so I guess we need to do a roll call vote. Uh, so I vote yes, Tom. Yes, and I'm going to recuse myself. Right. Thank you. Carol? Yes. Uh, Erica? Yes. Rob? Yes. Francis? Yes. And I think I've got everybody who's here. Did I leave anybody out? No. Okay. 
you know, we don't have any more attendees now. Yeah, I think though the- um, We should do it anyway. Okay. Yeah, the concern is that someone could join and then, it, you know. Okay, so yeah. everybody, uh, Nate did send out an email maybe an hour or two hours before we're meeting now. So we need to switch to that Zoom link. All right. Thanks, everyone. You know, I Thank need to, you. I need to stop the recording and just do a few things. All right.